Okay, like I said, uh, um, because of the things we do and one's learning to do more and more, um, I've tried to set up um, this lecture. So anything I, I do on, on Google Meet so that it can also be watched by other people who may not join us as students or so live. So um, as we speak, it's gone live on, on my channel in YouTube at the moment. Um, because I'm also working towards, in case um, the people in the conference we are hosting um, ask me to do that. So um, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I have all the bases set up. So um, if anyone knows my channel at Studio Aquan on YouTube, it should be running live there. Okay, having said that now, let me... Um, start this um, lecture lecture and um, it has to do with statistical logic one sorry logic two statistical logic two um, maybe I should go back to look at logic one because we did so as to remind us something of what we've done before um, what we've done before, and then we'll be able to probably um, just run through that and then um, be able to remind ourselves of what we're doing and where we've come from uh, in talking about statistical logic, just to run through it so that um, we can keep ourselves abreast. So let me mean to just bring down this one and call up um, statistical logic logic um, one it was a lecture we had in june uh, so just to remind us of what we did okay so statistical logic one. In statistical logic one, um, we did um, look at certain things. We did look at certain things about statistical logic and try to, the background was the fact that man is naturally inquisitive and makes inquiries every day. And this you know, based on this, his inquiries, he takes decisions. Um, research is also as, as, as a kind of inquiry, but it is not like the casual inquiry that, um, you know, people make on daily basis when they wake up and see that the sky is um, a bit um, cloudy. And they want to know, is there going to be rain and take decisions on such things? No. Um, in research, these inquiries have to be organized systematic procedural in other words one step leading um, to another interconnected steps one leading to another and that the research itself should be scientific and it should be replicable leading to unbiased results so the whole essence is to enable us to take decisions the whole essence is to enable us to take decisions based upon you know um, things that we have found out okay um, the outcomes of the research now therefore there is the need to follow a universally accepted you know, way scientific logic this universally accepted scientific logic is what we call research um, is what we call statistical logic so it is um, a description of consecutive steps to scientific, replicable, and unbiased results. So that is what science, statistical logic is about, based upon statistics. And um, this, we went on to look at what the first uh, step in the logic, which is about focusing the study. In focusing the study, the first things we do is to identify a problem. We have always given this um, definition of research 
has been systematic inquiry, you know, to obtain data to solve a given problem. So there is the need first to identify the problem before you even start out to go trying to solve it through gathering data. So we, we, we noted that, that and we, we gave a bit of a, a brief description of what, how and what it means to identify um, problem from a generic one to specific research one to a bit of that specific research one that we hope and we articulate that we hope to resolve through our own particular research. Of course, we define the particular scope of the problem and then do our best to resolve it. This issue, and um, many times when we make corrections in the work, it comes up that if you don't clarify the problem, then research is not said to be done. It is about solving problems, about solving problems. Okay, so um, to solve problems, to, you need to go and gather data. And to gather data, you have to know what data you're going to gather. And the, the, the way to, to, to clarify that data is to operationalize variables. And this is about, you know, determining what is the, the thing I'm going to go and gather data about. We describe how to go about operationalizing variables through factorization, um, understanding what variables of interest, what constructs of interest, and then breaking it down so that we know when we get to the field, this is what we'll be looking for. This is the kind of questions we'll be asking and all that. So we give a description of all of that. And then we try to also clarify what hypothesis was about. We did say, and I know we'll keep repeating, that um, um, when you have come to uh, identify what the problem is, you need to break the problem into parts. And those parts, through those parts, you formulate objectives and research questions you hope to resolve. You know, objectives are the means of accomplishing an aim, which is what the research is about. And then, of course, um, through research questions, we now hypothesize, you know, make assumptions at the outset that we hope to prove whether they are correct or not. By putting forth these um, assumptions, um, they were able to give direction as to the research otherwise. We did, you know, speak about that in the last. Uh, so we also clarified about types of um, research, sort of types of hypothesis, types of hypothesis. Um, Dr. Poe, are you raising your hand, sir? Is that Me? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. It was right. in our so, Okay. So, and we described to us the types of research hypothesis, um, one unidirectional or one directional or one way hypothesis, two non directional hypothesis or two way hypothesis or two tail hypothesis, the same thing, or three null hypothesis. <laughs> so, we gave a description of all that in the last um, lectures. And we also talked about the conditions for formulating testable hypotheses. Um, the, the hypothesis in statistics, hypotheses are formulated at the outset and they will be tested by statistics. You know, they will be tested by statistics. For them to therefore be correct and be testable, it must be stated usually in a null form. Um, not that it must always be in a null form, but it can be stated in a null form. It must be investigating significance, because it's not a matter of just that there's a relationship or there's a difference, but that that relationship is not due to chance or error, so it is significant statistically. Then also, it must be the, the variables that are to be tested must be distinguishable in that statement of the hypothesis. You know. Um, variable A on the one hand, you know, having a significant relationship or significantly different from variable B. You know, there should be a clear means of measuring from the outset also, there should be a tool, a tool that is, that is available, known to statisticians that can be used to test that uh, hypothesis, you know, from the beginning. Okay, so these were the, 
the things that we, we described or discussed in um, um, statistical logic one. Okay, so right now we want to continue from there to discuss statistical logic um, two. So I, I just try to run through that so that's to re refresh a little bit, jog our memories, because I know it's a while we did all of this. Okay, so um, in discussing that, I just want to mention again, the last bit of thing we discussed in statistical um, logic one was um, a hypothesis. Um, if you go uh, online in literature, you're, you're likely to see um, different kinds of classifications or types or descriptions of hypotheses. Um, just for the benefit of, of um, um, those of us who also go online, just want to highlight something that we may see in terms of additional classifications. So you will see things like, um, as you see in the slide, simple hypothesis. Um, just um, talking about relationships between a single dependent and a single independent variable. Complex hypothesis, one um, variable versus several, or several versus several, you know, as you know. Uh, so there are many more uh, components or variables being um, looked at. Then, of course, directional hypothesis, um, which specifies the expected direction. You will notice in what I have described or we have described in the previous lecture, we have described actually three types of hypotheses and those continue to be the main focus that should be of interest for anyone who's doing research. All these other classifications are um, uh, incidental as it were. So you would have directional hypothesis in, 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 in what we had described in the last lecture, we called it one-way hypothesis or unidirectional hypothesis, you know, uh, a one tail, you know. It, the, the, the description is such that it tells you that um, this um, uh, specifies the direction in which, which is to be followed in determining the relationship between uh, variables. You know, um, gender is likely to affect you know, a satisfaction amongst, um, you know, um, users or, or residents of uh, an estate or something, however else we do it. So it's already given us the direction that this is likely to, this is, will have a significant relationship on this. So it gives the direction, it's that direction that, and it's usually based upon known theory that these things affect that. So whether it is proven so, you know, when the test is done based upon the data that is gathered, it's a different matter. But um, directional hypothesis, you know, gives an assumption in, that pushes the, the proposition in one, one, one direction. Because non-directional hypothesis, we, in our case, we said um, uh, we had already described it as two-tailed, you know, two-tailed and all that, if you remember what we had done. And then there's the, the idea or the classification of associative and um, causal hypothesis that, you know, um, often you see this in experimental research where uh, the, the, that, that relationship that if this is add, if a, a, a plus B will be equal to C, that kind of um, relationship, associative or causal, and this is likely to cause so on. So, and of course, no hypothesis, which is a, um, usually denoted, de denoted by H0, that's the way it's usually written. Um, it's a negative statement um, to support the researcher's uh, uh, assumption that, you know, there is no significant relationship between variable A and variable B. And often when, in many cases, um, uh, some schools that uh, a null hypothesis is proposed. Um, an alternate is also proposed, you know, which exactly says the opposite to what it challenges the, the null, you know, and states that there is such a relationship as existing. Okay, so this is still just describing um, 
hypothesis and just um, uh, you know go back to what we have already been doing. So today um, it's about statistical logic two. This is eleven oh two. Let's see what how far we'll be able to go in the next um, one hour. All right, let's look at re recall again a preamble to these things that we're doing. PhD is an academic degree, and um, um, even though not all of us involved um, in obtaining it, um, obtain it because we're academic, but um, as it's essentially a research degree. So um, in real sense, it's supposed to be able to enable the, 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 um, the, the, the person who acquires it you know, gives him skills in research. So it's really supposed to be applied to research, you know, area of work, any work, but most especially in academics. So, and you recall that in academics, that's in the university, teaching research institutions and stuff, there are three core things that are done. And um, that is teaching, which is research, and then community service. Teaching involves recycling and no knowledge, no knowledge. Um, um, research means searching out new, solving new problems, adding to the, the um, bank of information, the store of knowledge that exists. And of course, community service means carrying out activities to serve whether university or government or the community where we live and all that. This is what is expected generally of academics. But the PhD work itself, you know, is about solving or giving problem. Research is the anchor of all academic activity that anyone does in university, polytechnic, institution like that. You know, um, like I've already said, it's the means by which you acquire research skills, PhD, PhD is, a, it is a means by which you acquire this research skills that is the, 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 the one of the pillars of the work that is done. So um, so that's why you see you talking about research and what research is about, research methodology and all of that, because it's about acquiring the skill and the knowledge to be able to carry out and um, research, which is about accumulating or getting more knowledge oh, than we already have. Oh, yeah, yeah, what, so, yeah, hello, are you hearing me? Your yeah, voice is going lower and lower. Okay, permit me, sorry, forgive me. Let me hope mm. I am adjusting the volume. Okay. okay, I hope you can hear me better now. Yes. Hopefully. Okay, so sorry. Okay, so, um, so like I said, um, the research is so, sorry, PhD is also a degree that is obtained via research. So through researching, you acquire the skills that you need. As such, it forms a definite and important base for publications, for academic degrees, uh, engages in advancement of knowledge, and of course, in obtaining promotions. So PhD work is about research, solving problems and learning how to carry out more research about solving more problems. As a result, therefore, every PhD student must define a research interest, um, which is why I kept insisting that the newer people come in, because they are getting to the point where they must define this research interest. You know, and I'm going to break down and give an example of what I mean as we get along. So they may start with one interest and eventually divert to another. You know, very various things can spark the interest of the researcher, um, and which which um, brings me back to that second seminar. There was that second seminar that um, we we are some of us are of our colleagues are working on. That seminar on research and ethics is supposed to lean on your research interest. You know, if your research interest is in housing, then it has to be d discussed in relation to that research interest. If it's on um, CAD, it has to be discussed in relation to CAD. 
if it's on uh, whatever area that you at least at this point seem to be showing interest in that seminar is supposed to be written relative to it not just in general terms just like we were discussing before so usually there are different things sometimes it's because it comes from our backgrounds the things we studied in school the subjects of interest you know maybe our professors who taught us and the, the, the ones we liked you know uh, may have inspired us maybe the human settlement studies architectural education history of architecture you know um preservation all sorts design you know so those things stir up our interest and as we develop we also uh, grow uh, so it is necessary to define a research interest and from that interest define a research focus you know like i said I will, uh, i'm going to give you an example of what i mean by research interest and research focus so it's important uh -huh. research interests are brought by their nature are brought by their nature and uh, may be applicable to various professions take for example human settlement studies you know uh, it's an area where geographers are talking about human settlements urban planners are talking about human settlements if estate managers are talking about it environmental managers engineers also all sorts of engineers architects all about human settlements you know they're involved in it just like we talk about the built environment the many professions who are dealing with the built environment lord it be, then it becomes necessary that um one pick an area of interest within this uh a wider uh, scope of um, interest so um an example uh, uh, for example is that your, your research interest could be housing sustainability rural you know from within housing it could be an area of housing low-income housing and stuff like that so um research interest so within this research interest there has to be a research focus it's important uh then from that research focus a research topic must be chosen to clarify the specific part of the focus we are studying that we are being interested in so within a research focus area where the researcher is working particular study must be defined for the phd work which we are involved in this is clarified in the research topic you know for example like i've already told us um, in housing which is common we always have people who are studying housing it's a very um widely studied area you could have um uh, for housing studies which in itself blossomed into one one uh, uh, you know area in itself you could have um, um low cost housing housing theory um and concepts materials you know you could have technology of housing you could have planning you could have policies have urban houses urban housing you could have um cost you know and all of that um etc uh, etc et so there are different bits and pieces which will now show up in what is the topic that the the, the phd person is interested in not minding this large area of housing or housing studies or human settlement studies as we have described so from this focus now the student derives a title for his dissertation you know for his dissertation or for his thesis for his thesis dissertation they usually use for for msc for thesis for phd okay so it's important that we're able to from all of this um let me come to an illustration what i'm about if you look at um on your screen i've tried to uh, project um the first diagram on the left um the breakdown the first thing on the first uh statement on top and you see the arrow going down it's about human settlement studies as a research interest you know human settlement studies as a research interest then within that human settlement studies we're talking about housing studies you know uh, housing studies 
as a research focus, because there are different kinds of human settlement studies anyway, but as a research focus, we could be talking about housing uh, studies. Then even further then to define a research topic to be low income housing, low income housing, and then to further drill it down to something we can work with, we can now um, summarize it to a title, which is housing low income civil servants. For example, this is um, uh, Professor Lotua's uh, work I'm using as an example. You know, so housing low income civil servants in emerging state capital, the case study of Adoikiti, Nigeria. So yeah. um, you, uh, you, you have wide areas, but you must finally drill down to which part of which part of which part of these large areas of study that you have taken interest that you want to um, um, look at. You know, I can also give another example. Um, I give example with my own work, which was in um, um, the area of architectural education as a research interest, you know, how you educate architects. Then the research focus was on the curriculum, curriculum studies within this um, um, gamut of architectural education, which has multifaceted things. And then uh, drilling it further down to a research topic, it was computer application to architecture, you know, computer application to architecture. The aspect of curriculum studies that I was interested in was computer application to architecture. Then the title that I eventually came up with after, you know, of course, supervision and correction was implementation of computer aided design curriculum in National Universities Commission accredited architecture departments in Southeast Nigeria. So everyone who is in the PhD program has to uh, follow this process to clarify what it is that they are studying. It's important. This is, this is research. It's about solving a particular problem. You can solve all the problems, but you must come to the point where you clarify exactly what aspect your own research will hope to solve, you know, um, through um, the, 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 the PhD in the program. So whichever area it is, broad as it may be, must break it down from research interest to research focus, to research topic to research uh, title. Okay, then you will note again that research, and I've said this continually, it's about systematic inquiry to obtain data to solve a given problem you know so phd work is systematic inquiry to solve a defined problem to solve this problem data is obtained analyzed and presented you know and then this information that and conclusions emanating from this work are documented in a PhD thesis and given to an examiner to, you know, evaluate. If you look at figure six in, in, in on the slide, you see this process. I've highlighted it with buttons going in a particular direction. You define a problem. Um, it's important that we clarify this. It's, you need to define a problem, or else you, whatever other story you are telling is really a waste of time. When, it, when an examiner comes, he looks at the beginning of your work, he examines what is this man hoping to resolve. And he takes it, he gets it clearly, and immediately without, before even looking at the intervening pages, go to the end and see your outcomes, whether you have resolved it. If you claim you are going to do so and so and produce, you know, a framework for better housing quality. Aha. So if you investigate this to resolve so and so and produce better framework, we'll go and see the outcomes. Did you resolve this so and so? And what was the framework in that uh, paper? So you must define the problem, then you go and obtain the data, then you analyze the data, then you present the data, 
then in the book, of course, submit the PhD and by the grace of God, receive your PhD. So that's the flow. That's the flow, the workflow for PhD research. Okay. Then you also note that, you know, the PhD exam, the, the examiner will uh, expect to see and examine three broad sections of this, your thesis that you have gone and done. Three broad sections. And I've placed it in a diagram form in figure seven to your bottom right on the screen. Okay, so um, these three broad sections are research background, research methodology, and research outcome. You know, um, some of us have started already working on their stuff. So research background will include things like background to the study, your statement of problem, your aim and objectives, the study, you know, your research questions, hypothesis, your justification for the study, what area, what is the scope, you know, into the literature review. Because your work is divided largely in our school in five chapters. Chapter one is in called Introduction. That's the title of chapter one. And it's essentially what you say you want to do. You describe it under those subheadings. Your chapter two is called Literature Review. It is what other people have said about this matter you said that you want to do. That is about your topic, you know. This chapter one and chapter two together are what I'm now calling research background. So what it is you're going to do, what other people have said, this is this is no knowledge. You know, this is the platform on which you are rising because um, research is incremental. Um, you're not reinventing the wheel, you're only adding additional knowledge and extending the frontiers of um, knowledge. Then in your chapter three, which is a, a major, major part of your work as well, is what is called research methodology. You, sh you will describe your research design. You'll talk about your data. Research methodology, of course, has three types, three, three sections, you know, data gathering, data analysis, data presentation. So you, you, this how you, you have, um, which is uh, the, the heart of what we're going to talk about, you know, really here now in this statistical logic, which is about sampling and sampling theory. You, how you've designed the entire project to go, you like how you're going to go and carry out your data. Chapter three, how you will do what you said you are going to do. Chapter one, what you will say you're going to do. Chapter two, what other people have said about what you say you're going to do. Chapter three, how it is you're going to go about doing that thing you said you will do. So, and describe design, describe the data you're going to gather, describe how you're going to analyze it, describe how you're going to present it. And of course, the third, you know, uh, aspect of your you know, section, broad section that, you know, the examiner will look at is your outcomes. Chapter four, and then chapter five. Chapter four is presentation, you know, discussion of what it is you've gathered. And of course, chapter five is conclusions. So these are the broad sections and um, you will hope to write, every PhD a student will hope to write and write clearly so that you know um, the examiner can understand and agree that the work has been done. Okay, so having said that, let's look at the main issues that we want to um, this course. All right. Now, before I even um, um, talk about sampling theory and talk about sampling, let, let me again note that um, what we are involved in, the, our methodology, because I talked about methodology, is quantitative methodology. We are involved in quantitative methods. Um, there are three methods, essentially, research methodologies that every school will pitch their tent one way or the other. It has to do with quantitative methods. Quantitative methods is about if 
the whatever data uh, can be manipulated mathematically or statistic using statistics then it you are surely doing quantitative methods or if it's basically descriptive you know and telling stories to you know illustrate it is qualitative methods uh -huh. um and you, you could also use mixed methods well, in our case um here in our school most of what we have done and continue to do up till this moment has been quantitative methods but uh, uh, qualitative methods are not outside of our reach and you know capacity when we do uh, focus group discussions in-depth interviews those are uh, uh, data gathering using qualitative means and often the analysis is also applicated uh, uh, applied in a qualitative manner often um, there are new systems and all of that that try to interpret qualitative data and, and code it into quantitative means mm, here and there yes but these three methods are uh, likely how each school you know pitches their attend quantitative if it is largely manipul manipulable using mathematics and statistics qualitative if it is largely descriptive or quantitative if you mix sorry uh, mixed methods if you if you apply the two together okay so um having now mentioned that we are essentially um, a quantitative school um so when we describe sampling and the theory and uh, that understanding also goes with it okay sampling and sampling theory now you note that the essence of um research process is to enable the researcher take statistical decisions that's why i had to describe this matter of quantitative qualitative and all of that so we're taking statistical decisions remember our topic is statistical logic most often in our climb that is in in our environment in our country in the schools of architecture we do correlational research that is we're looking at the impact of one variable to another as opposed to experimental research which um, seeks to find out causal you know relationships you know um, if you manipulate a certain um, variable in such a manner it's likely to cause change in another variable and all that so um, we're not likely involved that in involved with that in our climb in our schools of architecture okay so having noted therefore that um, we go about so like you know we go about to gather data to carry out research but that research is uh, carried out among a population you know among a population so research population what is research population research population is essentially you know uh, we need to define this at the outset you know it's essentially the population which encompasses all the items of interest in the domain of the research so at the outset as a researcher we must define what our population is you know what our population is and that is usually within the area of study so the, the research population is all the items of interest you know in the domain of the research in its universe like i said within the area of um, study um, it's not the same thing as demographic population demographic population usually has to do with people you know but research population does not necessarily mean people you know the demographic population is the population of the people within a geographical area okay uh -huh. but when we study say housing conditions of course in a residential estate, a given location, whatever, you know, the, the population or the universal the universe of the study, as, as you call it in research, will include residential houses within the estate, not necessarily the number of people who live in it. You know, some of our um, colleagues who have done this uh, and experts in this will uh, uh, confirm, you know, the houses are the items of interest, you know, aha. Uh -huh it could be also cars on the road you know 
It could be schools of architecture in Nigeria, you know. Uh, it could be library buildings in the zone, like somebody studying, you know, libraries in Southeast um, Nigeria. So it's a population upon which the resource will be generalized, not necessarily the human beings in that area, you know. So all items of interest in the domain of the research, you know, is the population upon which the, the results will be generalized. That is the research population of interest. Take note of interest. Okay, this research population, this 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 population we call research population could be theoretical, it could be non-theoretical. And what do we mean by that? Theoretical population is the totality of the research population, which includes the parts that are difficult to reach physically. Uh, and so must be studied by indirect means. Okay, for example, say, you know, schools. We're studying schools. That is our research population within uh, maybe Southeast and South South Nigeria. Ah, but because of challenges, we may not be able to reach all the schools there. Take, for example, because of um, uh, the common thing we've experienced, um, insecurity. Because of insecurity, we're not able to reach all the schools within that um, universe that, and, and that area and that domain that we have described. It could also be that the geography is inhospitable. <laughs> you know, it's just located in a difficult region that is, you know, um, we have to maybe go through water or go through one difficulty or the other. But it is theoretically within the universe because that is the domain we have described. That is, is the area of study we have described. Uh -huh. But it is not uh, 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 practical, it's, it's, theor it's theoretical. So the non-theoretical population in this case, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the research populations that can be reached, so can be studied. We can count them, we can get to them. Another, you know, um, description of non-theoretical, of theoretical population, pardon me, uh, of theoretical population is when you have a concept, you know, uh, say you, you construct a concept that like urban poor, ah, may be difficult to locate who is the urban poor within a, a within an area within a domain within you know uh, a study area uh -huh. because i'm not it's really associated with physical location or nature of work yes and not necessarily so the the people you see selling fish or granite whom ordinarily because of their status of what they're doing someone may say ah these are vampire maybe richer than many of the people who have government jobs because they earn more and able to um, train their people and also such concepts that are theoretical in nature uh, make uh, for what you call theoretical um, population as opposed to non-theoretical which are people that can be readily identified readily reached and therefore readily studied so that's about research population another concept to um, take note of which we apply in uh, our sampling is the study or the target population. You know, the study population, sometimes called target population. You know, uh, it's about, there's a, there's a subset of this uh, research population we've described that is actually studied. Yes, as a subset, you know, it is the population upon which the research instrument is administered may have a large population but we actually get to study a section of it so that section of it is called um, the um, study population the population on which the research instrument is administered uh, recall that non-theoretical population um, includes all items that can be reached um, in the research process not all are eventually assessed maybe okay those items of interest which we have access access is sought and you know gained by administering research instruments 
is what is called the study or the target population. Okay, now the next concept we also must keep in mind in this our sampling theory is sampling frame. Sampling frame. Now you note that some populations are countable, are countable, can be numbered, you know, can be listed. For example, the list of students, the number of registered cars in Nigeria or in a state or something, the number of registered architects in Nigeria or in a state or something, you know, um, the, the state, the federal federation, because there's a register, you know, uh, um, the number of, um, of polytechnics, departments of architecture, for example, in Nigeria or in a state or in a region, these are known, they're finite, they can be listed, they can be named, you know, the number of buildings in an estate, etc., etc. You know, once there is such a list and you know it comes between the boundary of what we have now described as a non-theoretical you know population that we have confidence that we can you know reach and administer you know uh, and target for our instruments to get to and they can be listed they become what we call a sampling frame so a sampling frame essentially becomes um, uh, a list, a list, a list, you know, a list of elements in a particular population, a list of elements in a particular population that within which we will, you know, go forth to um, take a sample from. Know that not all populations are listed or listable. For example, I just spoke to us and said um, one of the uh, things that can be listed is a list of registered architects in Nigeria. Well, however, you may not be able to list all architects in Nigeria. You can list the registered ones because they are registered and there's an organization like ACON that keeps such a register. But beyond that, some of, some of me ask and say to me, oh, maybe they're not architects then, if uh, <laughs> they're not in accounts register. But that's a different argument uh, to a different uh, forum. Uh, so um, that, that they are listable um, within a population, all the elements are, can be counted and accounted for, then it becomes a sampling frame. Okay. Last on that um, uh, page is a sample. A sample. You know that in um, a survey research, such as study populations, and that's why we began to describe matter of research population, target population or study population, and then sampling frame. It's all about studying populations. You're studying a phenomenon that is occurring within a population. That's essentially what researchers go on to do. However, for logistic, logistical reasons, um, it's inconvenient, if not impossible, to study all items in a population. Yes, particularly as the population becomes larger and larger. You know, uh, you, you want to, to conduct um, a, 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 a research about, um, like we've already given an example, um, all the, the state of buildings in a residential estate. That estate has, you know, 400, such similar buildings, 1,000 such similar buildings or such. It's a massive number to go examining each building one by one. So some of them, either for inconvenience or for cost or just impossible to look at. Um, I'm looking at um, all sickle cell patients, you know, in um, Imo State or Southeast. 
may just be challenging to look at, you know, and all that and all that. So, um, it, where where it is possible to to study, if it's a small number of um, items in the in the sampling frame, and it's possible to look at all of them, and in some cases it is there is such possibility. What is done is called a census. In other words, you pulled everyone, and it's, you have not really taken a sample. You've looked at every case and every person that is involved, everything, every item that's involved. Okay. Where all things are studied. So there's a total enumeration, there's a, there's a census. You know, um, so because of this difficulty, this inconvenience, researchers now do what is called sampling. They take a sample, you know, they take a sample that is representative of that population. So that when they now you know study that population. Whatever results they get, they can generalize over these other homogeneous, in other words, other items that are similar to them relative to the factors that have been uh, defined or described at the initial. So a sample is a subset of a population, you know, that is studied in place of the population and the result is generalized, you know, over that population, you know. Uh, so, samples, like I've, you, I've already raised, mentioned the word homogeneous, samples that are studied should be, have similarities. In other words, in that list, in that sampling frame, you know, all the items should be homogeneous. You know, they should be, the, the sample picked should be truly representative of that population in order to allow you to generalize you know, a generalization to be made over that population by studying, I you know, just a small portion of it. If a sample is not truly representative of the population, the result will be spurious. You know, for example, as an example, um, the performance of a class in, say, architectural design could be conducted, you know, using a sample from the class. If the sample is not picked correctly, it should could show that the class is doing extremely well. If the sample is picked and all oh, the only ones that are picked are those ones that did well, to give a wrong impression of, you know, uh, the representation of what is happening in the class. If also you pick a sample that is of the poor performance alone, you could just give the impression, therefore, that the class is a poor performing class, which is not true. So it's not representative. So um, it's important that the, 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 the sample is picked that is representative of the population. So that when you now study that sample, whatever it is that is the result can logically make that a generalization from it that applies to that population. Okay, um, let me break at this point and ask if there are any questions before I move on. I've done about um, maybe one hour, a little less than 50 minutes. This is 11.41 now, one hour from when we started. Um, does anyone have any questions, any issues I clarified before I delve further into sampling, sampling theory? Okay, Dr. Koye, please go ahead. Sorry. You said that uh, PhD is a research degree obtained via research. Yes. Uh, is MSc the same thing, obtained a, a degree through research too? Or is not? In, architect in architecture. MSc, uh, yes, in architecture. Yeah, yes, in architecture not necessarily so the research component of it is minimal till date in most schools till date in most schools there they are uh, uh, it is again it is it is because of the way the schools have been framed um architecture is still not wind 
hasn't weaned itself from the days of, um, you know, um, uh, mentor uh, relationship where you train people by teaching them how to draw, how to design in the studio. Um, so uh, often prob uh, the issues where that with the children are grappling with or the students are grappling with are, are, are theoretical, they're not practical. They are not often solving real problems per se. They are recycling um, known knowledge, you know, in terms of known principles. So in that, in that, um, 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 in that instance, then you can say they have done research. Not, there's nothing new that they have resolved, essentially. And that has still been the practice because we lean more so much on design, not in bringing forth new knowledge per se. Because um, research is about articulating a particular problem and going on to resolve it. But our approach still hasn't lent itself so much to that. Some schools of architecture at the MSc level are trying to introduce that more and more, but the majority are still uh, hampered by many things, not just the background in terms of um, 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 MSc by research. So I don't call what we're doing in MSc research. Uh, that's my okay. candidate. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Any any other question or issue raised? Uh, again, okay. again, again. Can I go on? Yes, sir. Go on. Go on. I, uh, when I made my choice of uh, topic for series, I started from um, what do you call it? Waste disposal, liquid waste. And I did it for three years. And I was being encouraged by my supervisor up to a point when I was to face uh, faculty uh, defense. And it was now, I was now reminded that this, that topic was mechanical engineering topic or urban regional planning topic. Then I had to change to housing. I still ask myself, is uh, waste management or uh, sewerage, it was purely exactly sewerage, is it very much outside what architecture should handle? I've done my PhD, okay, but I'm still asking myself that question. Um, I, I still... wish... Dr. Kukoye, I, I, I think... Yeah. Um... I'll just give you a short answer then. Uh, uh, my yeah, other colleagues, short answer, everyone, yes, everyone in the class can weigh in on this and subsequently so I can be able to make progress. Um, the, the, the idea which was brought to you then now is that your work should clearly distinguish itself to be in the domain of architecture. Okay. Whatever you do, it's a degree in the department of architecture. It should, when you're true, when you discuss it, should be such that it is architectural from the perspective you bring it. So that one does not um, misunderstand it as being from a different department. And that's why you were encouraged to whatever you were doing, shift the focus. Remember the matter of, um, uh, I raised this matter of um, human settlements as a research interest, housing, yes. stu housing studies yes. as a research focus. Even within housing studies, you will agree with me, it's not only architects that are doing housing studies because there are various aspects of housing quantity surveyors are into housing and the mathematics and the prices and the calculations of it, you know, because that's 
that's a part of the, uh, the uh, uh, remit. Um, other geographic geographers, even urban planners, are also into housing. And what yeah. they will come out, they will come out from their own angles of it. So, as if we are doing ours in the Department of Architecture, you should show what is the architecture, uh, the preponderance of architecture in it. So, I guess that that is what is for, informed the the um, um, direction yeah. was gave, and that will inform the direction we will give anybody to today. We must show the architecture and what you are doing. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, okay. okay, thank you very much. Let, let me uh, move on from this point. Um, go on to talk about um, push sampling theory a bit more. Sampling theory. So now that we we'll, we'll try to clarify what sam sample is, sampling, sampling is the process of um, obtaining samples, essentially. You know, so it's a sampling. Sampling is the process by which you obtain samples from a population, you know. Uh -huh. So, and the, you are studying a population, not just for the sake of it. You are studying a population um, to understand relationships, uh, you know, with, that exist within it. There are phenomena that are occurring within those populations, and you want to understand relationships of uh, certain things. Uh, that exists within this uh, population. Sampling theory, as we are describing it now, is about the relationship within populations, you know, uh -huh. and within the samples drawn from the population. You know, it has three goals. So you know what I'm, you know what I've just said. It's about describing relationship within populations and. This within the samples that are drawn from the populations, because if you understand the relationships within the samples, then you generalize it to the population itself, like has been said. So sampling theory has three goals, three goals. One, statistical estimation. Two, statistical inference. Three, hypothesis testing. Okay, statistical estimation. For example, one may want to describe the characteristic of a class of um, 60 students without having to observe and record the data for everyone in the number. You want to describe the characteristics of this entire class, but you don't want to have to go to everyone and take their data. Okay, so a truly representative sample of perhaps six students, you know, six students, that's one into 10, may be taken and data gathered, you know, from this particular six and used, you know, to describe the entire 60 class of 60, you know. Um, the values that we gather, the data that we gather from these uh, items or, or subjects or, of the sample, in this case, the persons are called statistics. The values, data we gather from the population or the sample of the population are called statistics. While values derived for the entire population, so sorry, the, 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 the values we gather from the, the, the sample are called statistics, but the values we gather from the population are called parameters. Yes, you, you talk about population parameters, you know, they talk about statistics relative to the sample. So in research, the aim is always to estimate the population's parameters. Yes, you know, so you still estimate the population's parameters by, you know, gathering the statistics of the sample. You know, so we derive values called statistics from the sample and we use it to estimate the parameters of uh, a population, you know. Uh -huh. So uh, we, we could get the statistics of a sample of, um, uh, you know, let, let me use that six students again uh, from that 60. And uh, from 
what we're able to get, we, we can we know that provided the, the, the sample is representative of the entire population, if there are uh, 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 four female and two male, we know that the, the population is more, more female than male. If uh, whatever they are, they are uh, you know, um, um, four, three whites and three blacks, we know that the population is uh, um, balanced between blacks and white or such things. So we, we use the statistics we get from the sample to estimate the parameters of the population. Um, usually because of the difficulties in observing all the elements in the given population, like we've stated, um, sampling cannot be avoided uh, because usually our populations are large and which we are dealing with. So we assume, of course, that sampling has been done correctly, which is why, why all this story and this lecture, we must make every effort to sample correctly or else our results are not correct. You know, the results we get will be not truly representative and therefore won't make generalizations. We're making and getting incorrect parameters. So um, to do correct sampling that will offer this representative population to occur, you know, research recommends that we do random sampling. Yes, you know, rather than deliberate sampling, not was picking just the ones we like, you know, uh -huh. random sampling presupposes that everybody has been given a fair chance and certain uh, basic rules have been applied so that you can get a representative from a homogeneous population. Okay, sampling theory is only applicable, therefore, to random sampling. So the theory that we're explaining and um, you know, uh, talking about uh, works with random sampling. Um, when you do deliberate sampling, anything can happen. You're not sure what the results will be, and it will not be um, correct to use it to estimate population parameters. Okay, so that's about statistical estimation. Uh, we get statistics from sampling, and we use it to you know, estimate parameters. So that's one goal of um, um, sampling theory. And statistical inference. After doing analysis on the data get, gathered from a sample, the researcher must generalize their result. We've already alluded to this uh, continually. Um, based on their findings, they make conclusions about the entire research population. You know, uh, statistical, statistical inference is simply the generalization made upon the population from the sample that has been studied. We can infer that the sample has these parameters, has these character characteristics based upon the sample. So it is one of the goals. First, to make an estimation. Second, to infer, you know, uh, from the results of the um, data gathered. Then the third uh, uh, goal of, of um, sampling theory is to test hypothesis, hypothesis testing. Testing hypothesis of the relationship between variables from a study of samples drawn from the population. We draw, draw, draw um, a sample from the population. We gather data called statistics, and we test the relationships between one part of that data called variable and another variable. So um, it is the one of the key things because it is only by testing hypotheses that we're able to establish if the relationships exist significantly. You know, so it is one clear goal that we have um, for. I put, uh, for sampling uh, theory. Okay. To further clarify, you know, the the foundations of correct sampling. We discussed 
um, sampling fluctuation. Sampling fluctuation. Sampling fluctuation. Now, because every human uh, effort, you know, activity is prone to error, <laughs> the, the, uh, this is also, this also occurs in research. And so there's an effort to calculate the amount of error introduced in a statistic, you know, that is derived from a sample. Statisticians have long had this, um, you know, issue, have tried to work out mathematically, you know, how much error is likely to occur as a result of our efforts in sampling, you know, and the research uh, process. We will note that as the sample diminishes in size relative to the population, what does that mean? Let's say we have our population is 100, so if we, if we um, sample that 100, in other words, conduct uh, a survey of everyone, uh, what you may call a census, we have taken on everyone. There is no error in sampling there because everyone is sampling, sampled. But we now are saying that as the sample size reduces relative to population, in other words, you could sample 95 of this 100, you know, you could sample um, 80 of this 100, 50 of this 100, you know, or even 10, one tenth. So as you, you reduce the number that you pick relative to the population, there's a greater likelihood that uh, uh, the, 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 there will be error. You know, this is a human activity. The margin of error will keep increasing as the number, of, as the size of the sample decreases relative to the uh, uh, population. So the margin of error for the statistic you are trying to gather is increasing. If error is reduced, the results are closer to the exact population parameter. That's why I said, if you have, if you have 100 and you are, the entire 100 is in your, is in your you know, um, uh, it's, it's, in your, it's in your sample. There is no error based on sampling because you've sampled everyone. Okay, but like we said, uh, our research populations are usually large. So we have to, we are forced to take samples. So there is a margin of error and it increases uh, as the size of the sample reduces relative to you know, the size of the population. So sampling fluctuation or sampling error, you know, occur in research in our endeavor, in our, in our endeavor to estimate uh, uh, the parameters of the population. They occur because it's a human uh, factor. The larger the sample size, the closer we are to the population and uh, the population parameters we're seeking and to estimate. Conversely, the smaller the sample size, the farther we are from the population parameters we are seeking to estimate so sampling error can be only determined for random sampling. Again, what we are, we are expecting that we are doing in our research is random sampling, largely, simply because purposive sampling does not allow for representative sample and, um, you know, and therefore um, cannot be logically um, derived or, or generalized over the population. So um, we need note, therefore, that it's for random sampling that we're discussing and that not for deliberate uh, sampling. Two factors affect sampling error. One is population variability. The other is sample size. Population variability and the other is sample size, and these are calculated. These are calculated. Okay, this is um, these are calculated. Done twelve o'clock now. All right, let's let's see whether we can just jump over this once and then I will wind up. Calculation of population. Um, 
variability, calculation of population variability. If we take a record of the performance of scores, for example, we take a random sample of six of, from 60 students, as we mentioned earlier, and the goal is to use the sample of six to estimate uh, parameters of the population of 60. In this case, the population mean. In other words, we're trying to find the population mean. That's the parameter we're looking for, okay? But we use the statistics that we get from the sample of six to establish what is the mean, in this case, mean score, perhaps, that is for, this, for, that, for that entire class. So uh, we see from our calculation that um, this, um, and we, 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 these six have a mean score of 68. Um, I'll, I'll break your indulgence to look at um, the table, the table nine that you see on your screen. Okay, so um, if we know that the mean score is um, 68, we can generalize the, this as the behavior of the entire class. Now, that is the mean score of this six. We take that as the mean score of the, the class, okay? So variability is the measure of how much the scores differ from the mean. We have taken six people, we take their scores, and um, we have 68, 68, 64, um, 74, 62, 72, you know, all there. And um, I'm not sure we've calculated that on the screen there, but if you look at the scores at our, on the first column of that table, um, the mean will be 68 uh, as the average. Okay, so we, 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 we use that to calculate variability variability and now variability is the measure of how much the scores differ from the mean and the um how much the scores differ from the mean to obtain that we calculate deviation we calculate variation we calculate variance then we calculate um variability Variability is our goal, but we are, we are we use mean. We use mean to obtain the deviation and to obtain variation. So if you look at the table, table nine, I take you to table nine again. Um, you will find that um, we have on the in the second column we have deviation, deviation from the mean x minus x bar x minus x bar x minus x bar x bar is the mean so we have the scores on the left the mean is 68 so the first one 68 minus 68 is zero okay all right and variation is x minus x bar squared so zero squared which is the third column that is zero so um if you follow it through like that for each and every one of them, you see the scores and you total it there. So the total variation, okay? The total variation. So variance, variance is summation. If you go back to our calculation on the left, summation of variation over N minus one. 104 is the score, is the total of the variation. We've seen that in the table. N minus one is six. The, the, the number of the, the uh, sample is six minus one, that is F. So 104 over, over five is 20.8. Okay. So that is how we get the variance. That is how we get the variance. 
Now, standard deviation is a measure, that's the standard measure of variability of the population is the standard deviation. In other words, statistically, the, the, the um, statistic that is obtained to talk about variability in statistics, the standard measure is standard deviation. So in calculating variability, we're actually looking for standard deviation. And the equation as shown there is um, square root of um, variance, essentially square root of variance. And it gives you 4.48 there. Okay. And all that and all that and all that. So. Um, the standard error is in estimating the population mean. Uh, da, 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 da. Is therefore that 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 you know, standard deviation. Uh, standard error equals a standard deviation of over square root of n, and on and on and then. Um, sorry, I'll take off concepts, but um, so two things. Let me let me go back. Two factors that affect sampling error. Two factors that affect sampling error. Population variability and then sample size. We've had a description of um, sample size in terms of the, the smaller the sample size, most likely the margin of error will increase. Um, we've come to describe how you calculate variability, you know, and variability, the, the, the basic statistic for variability is standard deviation. Uh, we'll try to, you know, explain how to calculate standard deviation by getting the mean a score, getting the deviation, getting the variation, and getting the variance. And variance is square, a summation, um, um, of the summation of variation over n uh, minus one. Standard deviation is square root of that, of the variance. And then we'll be able to know how far it goes. So depending on the size of that, then um, the, um, the bigger the size, of course, the more there's error in the, um, um, in the sample. The, the bigger the size, the more there's error in the sample. Okay. Let me um, introduce a couple of other concepts that are important. Important. Now we're talking about standard um, error. Error, you know, sampling error. Sam sampling error, yeah. And... Um, other concepts because these are, are, are fall into assumptions that must be made at the outset, you know, as we, you know, you know prepare our methodology and determine how uh, we will run. The first concept I, I, I take note of there is confidence interval, sometimes called confidence limit or confidence level. It is a number indicating how much confidence the researcher has that there is no error in the work. It, it usually cannot be 100%. So based upon what we've already said, that because it is a human, human uh, uh, action, there will be error. And researchers, therefore, you know, factor in this error by making a calculation that allows for it in the entire statistical analysis. Having therefore known that and established that there is possibility of error, different types of um, researches, different you know, class types of research, medical research, social research, you know, allow for certain kinds of error they will tolerate or not as you you know carry out your statistics you know so one of those concepts that come to play is what is called confidence level 
And confidence level is simply a number indicating how much confidence the researcher has that there is no error in the work. No researcher ever has 100% confidence. There's no, again, because of what I've already said. The only examples of this permitted in research are usually 99%, 9.9, 99%, 95%, about no? In our own research, the least accepted is 95%. And that will be stated and it will form part of the calculations when you are doing your sampling. Because certain assumptions means that you introduce certain figures and all that. The researcher must choose their value at the outset of the work, what is tolerable for your work. In our case, most of the times it is 95%. Values relating to this choice are then applied in calculation throughout the work, as I have stated. The next concept that is of importance in sampling is significance level. It is the converse, someone may say exact opposite figure of the figure derived in the confidence level numeric to indicate the acceptable level of error. What the first one says, the confidence that um, I have that local, there is no error in this work. This second concept now talks about this is the level, you know, uh, 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 of uh, acceptable level of error. That's speaking the same thing from two different angles. I accept 5%, therefore I'm confident that 95%, there's no error. If I accept if I'm confident that there's no 99%, there's no error, it means I'm only accepting 1%, you know, level of error. So for example, like I've already said, 95% confidence limit implies a significance level of 5%. 99% confidence limit implies 1% significance level. 99.9 .9 confidence level impl impl implies 0 0.1 significance level. So. It just says this is the acceptable level of error. It's also part of the statistic when you are relating. Okay, Satis, you want to ask a question? Yes, my question is, uh, uh, why, why did they have to use the word significant level as opposed to <laughs> confidence level? <laughs> okay, they, they've already said they are confident 99% or 95%. Uh -huh. 90%. So yes. I'm confident that to this extent that there's no problem with the thing. It's a human thing exactly. anyway, so I can't get 100%. So I accept that I can I can vouch, you know, that based upon what I have done, what we have done, what we have followed, that 95% uh, is okay. It therefore yes. means just by default, by that statement, it simply means that I'm willing to accept error to the other lim limit that is left in the 100%. Why they call it significance level, um, which is, I guess is your is your question. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm not being part of the, that committee that pointed that they yeah. don't exactly know. <laughs> but but it is it is significant that into the fact that there is there is sampling error to that, yeah. um, you know, uh, and. Um, if 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 so so it's an indication of um, confidence and um, uh, and when you make your statistics professor Gaw, we're coming uh, 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 let me just finish answering I'll I'll, I'll 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 allow you to to speak when you when you make your calculations and this is in statistics you know it, uh, you're looking for significant relationships. So when the statistics hits to the point where, as you will see, P, P is equals to that, 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 0 0.05, it affects, if, if the result of P that you get there, you know, exceeds that, then it is not significant. It means that you've allowed for so much. But if P exceeds this, 
then uh, so it, it, then, then the result is not significant. So I think we, it is with the end result you are trying to the matter, the matter that you are trying to get that this is the height at which the the error the error allows uh, the, 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 the 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 association is uh, uh, is not due to error or or or, or chance simply error or chance. Um, Sago, how you want to wake up? We're weighing on that. Yeah. Uh, yes, I want to weigh in. The, just as you are saying, the confidence level tries to tell us uh, the acceptable level of human error. That's the error that the researcher can cause or human beings, those involved, can cause. That is acceptable. Then the significance level talks about what happens as a result of natural relationships or natural causes, which is beyond the uh, control of the researcher. So significance level talks about significant. We say something is significant. It means that it's natural. It's a natural uh, phenomena. So it's not as a result of uh, the researcher or his uh, uh, assistant. So that's the meaning of a significant level of significance. Yeah, and that's it. Mm, sorry, sir. That, 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 that significance has to do with relationship, that the relationship being investigated is significant. So this is the, the, the top uh, limit at which once the, 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 the result is gotten and it is this or below, it is... The, the relationship is significant, not minding whatever human error that may have entered. It's natural. That's the issue. It's a, a, whatever is happening is a natural something. It's not the human now, human issue. It's okay. It's acceptable to me because I was looking at the definition of significance. Yes, it's not, it's not the literary meaning. It's not the literary meaning uh, from English. Meaning that's it's not it. Uh, that is why I'm. That is why that, that's why I'm raising concern. That exactly. That's I'm the first. That's the first concern. It's not the literary meaning or English meaning. He talks about the or what relationship or natural causes that is not of human. Okay. Let, 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 okay. I have no time. Okay, sir. Let me again highlight the word significance and relate it to what our goal is here. And we've said before, our goal is to establish correlation that something has significant relationship. Um, Sago has used the word natural causes that it has significant relationship and it is not due to error or sampling error you know uh, you know or chance or chance the word significance i believe is associated with the nature of relationship because there could be a relationship but it is not significant so this this manipulation statistical manipulations this result is chosen as the benchmark for knowing that that relationship is significant. That's why it's called significant scans level. Okay. Okay, sir. I accept. Okay, sir. All right. Let me main, continue. Mention the this other um, um, concept. Z-score. Z score, um, which you see in the screen. The, um, the critical value for a stated con confidence level, as each of the um, stated confidence levels has a calculated Z score. This is statistically calculated, you know, found in statistic books, you know, um, found in statistics books. Um, I've tried to illustrate a bit of what what to do uh, you want to calculate um, population means and all that but um if you go to statistics books as, as is shown in table 10 there if you have um 
um, um, a confidence level of say 95, um, you will have a, um, a significance level of uh, 5% or P equals to 0 0.05, as we will see with our SPSS calculations that um, once you've made this choice ab initio and, and in your sampling, which comes when you're looking for, uh, you're creating a, 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 getting the list of respondents, these assumptions, you will make them. And then of course the Z score for it calculated in the books is 1.96. And for each of those confidence levels, um, you will um, see that there's a corresponding Z score and all of that. Um, so um, with that, with that said, if you go back to our our um, um, calculation of population mean, which was the last um, statistic or, or, or parameter we're trying to define, below there there is a formula um, x bar plus z, you know, um, standard deviation of a square root of n. Uh, um, so here now the, start, the matter of z z has come in and has been introduced. That's why we, we went discussing confidence level, significance level, and the associated Z score. So you now bring that into that equation and you'll be able to calculate um, having chosen uh, um, what is your confidence level, having chosen a significance level, and therefore you know what your Z score is and it comes into that equation and therefore you can calculate your uh, population mean. Okay, so um, I don't know if I still have time, but I think I'm going to break this and continue this next week. I'm going to break this, continue this next week, um, talking about sampling methods and wind down on that. Um, I think I think that's what I will do. Is it next week or next two weeks? Sorry, sorry, so not even next two weeks. Next two weeks is. Um, seminar next time we have lecture okay. we'll complete this matter of uh, of sampling methods i think um, um, we've um spent our time we spent our time even though we started late so but I, i'll break here because uh, what the, the what is left to discuss will take us a little bit more time and i, I don't think we'll, well it's a little bit but a little bit but i, I think i'll still break it too the next lecture. All right, so at this point, I, I wish to, uh, if anyone has questions, they can ask or clarifications, they can bring for uh, uh, for the rest of the class, and then um, we'll go from, from there. All right, Jasper, you're here. Can we hear you? Yeah, good day, Prof. Yeah, good day. I, I have a, a question, but not on this topic i don't know yeah. if i could yeah go ahead uh, okay that the question is uh, on referencing and uh, citation uh a situation i i have I, I saw a material that is relevant to my work in a book that that ha, that is dated some years back. And the author of that book is late. But I just uh, picked that, that material from the book, not from a journal, not from an article where it is referenced. Which year am I going to? And let's say that the book uh, was published in 1968. And I, the material I found that is relevant to my study at this present day. So which, which year am I going to cite? Let me take an instance. The author is, um, uh, the author is uh, Rappaport. And uh, is, he dated about 1968. So which year am I going to uh, cite as the year um, that's uh, uh, in, in my reference, uh, in my reference section. Please. Is it going to be on that that 1968 that the book was published? Since I picked it from a book, or am I going to bring the 
the the the the date forward to suit my uh, to suit my studies. Okay, let, let me uh, answer as best as I understand your question. Let me first clear that the death of a person is not you're not citing you're not you're not bringing a person. Mm -hmm. It is the material that they have they have put forth. You can live after them. We are quoting the Bible thousands of years after it was written. And we cite it as a source and all that. But so you there's the source, the the, the, the whether the person is alive or not is no hindrance to reciting a material. That's number one. Number two. You mentioned that you got it from the original material. Yes, sir. Whatever material you obtained a thing from, ordinarily, I'm not finished, not landed completely, but ordinarily, that's where you should cite it from. If it's a book, it is a whatever sort of material it is that is citable, you should cite it from that source. However, because uh, the, joke, the, the entire process is not about manipulating something to suit your um, requirements or the requirements of the department and all that. Um, the, the, which, which is, I think, what is, is raising this question. You have been asked to um, um, ensure that your citations the majority of your citations are not dated. Yes. dated, meaning that they should be older than 10 years currency. Yes, sir. There is largely no idea, except when it is so um, unique that people have not written and rewritten about. That rapport port you are talking about, the same things he issued, he discussed, Except it is a theory which he has written and nobody else has cited or written about. Of course, you well go and write it. Even this 1900, right? You have the right source. But you, you hardly can claim that in the area you're writing that the same ideas have not been propounded by people in more current terms that are still relevant to your work and will still solve the same problem. And what the academics the community expects you to do is to go and find because the expectation and hope is that the people who write in more currency would have uh, improved on what that original person started out with. Many of these theories and and, and incidentally, many of them are most of them are not from architecture. They come from the social sciences, sociology, politics, you know, and in our own area, geography, and all that. Um, 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 by people who over the years have continued to bring forth these things. But other people have looked at their theories, analyzed them, discussed them, brought perspectives about them, and are continually evaluating the things that they have said. So uh, it will seem um, um, that you have not done sufficient work if you are still citing that original person as if there was no other who have talked about him and examined his work in later uh, material. So nobody's saying you can't cite someone who is a, a material that is 1968 per se, but um, the, the, the research in that area, whatever area it is, it's likely not to have stood still since 1968, you know. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. I, I think I, I, I get what you mean now, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, so, madam. Okay, I also think that um, he can look for materials on ResearchGate. I think ResearchGate has so much too that can he, he can get from there because sometimes when you have materials there, you're having in so many people reading and them. Um, associated references on different articles. So it's a whole lot. Um, he will find a lot of recent articles on whatever he's talking about. It's also one of the sources he can use. 
Yeah, yeah, research gate is one, but uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I and and recommended. One thing I would even additional one I would recommend is uh, Google Scholar. Yeah, Google that's Scholar. another one too. That's good. And uh, <laughs> and bring in your topic there. You will have excess of information. So much information. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. 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 So just to, to type Thanks. it, and I, um, and I said to us, there are very few people, it was um, 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 Dr. May who had worked with me on that. And I said to us, often when we come up with some of these articles, even some of them that we feel uh, we don't, they have, um, you know, Big pay, pay, pay walls, you know, but I'm not allowing you to get into them. If you send me some of these, uh, some of them, I may be able to uh, um, get them for you. I may be able to just get them for you. So it's left for, for us to work. There's, there's information, there's information, there's information. So let's, 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 let's go look for it. There will be current information. There usually is about the things that you're you're you're, you're mentioning. Uh, uh, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Madam, very much. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, I don't know if you have any other. We could then. Um... Okay. Um, architect on the chair. Architect on the chair, sir. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Alpha, 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 are you ready for for proposal? Uh, uh, Prof, you see the issues for the past four weeks have been trying to get okay, issues. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. You, you, are, still, you, are, still, you are, yes. are still working with you. Yeah, we are still working, uh, sir. We'll, we'll discuss that. Okay. Going. Okay. Um, Dr. Mora, back to you, sir. All right. Thank you, Prof, for your wonderful lecture. These are things I want, of course, to refresh our mind on what we've learned. Thank you for your time and dedication and family. All right. We we'll switched to seminars now. We had two candidates who couldn't present two weeks ago. So we agreed they will have their presentation today. Said Esinolo Jasper and said uh, Ibe Leonard. What's that? Doc, 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 I'm still working. I'm not ready today, sir. I'm still working on it, sir. Okay. I'm on the corrections my supervisor gave to me. Oh, okay. Guess we'll, we'll call it a day. So, on behalf of the teacher in the department and the PG committee of the department, I thank each and one of us, my senior colleagues. Professor Okolo, Professor thank you for for your time, for being with us. Dr. Koye, okay, thank you for your time and every other person. So let's keep working for the candidates. Let's keep working with our supervisors to make our work better. Then, Let's recall our faculty conference, the stay forthcoming. We are expected to start making payments and develop the after for those of us who submitted work, develop the the paper in preparation for the for the conference coming in October. So, Sorry, Doctor yeah. Dr. Mora, Doctor Mora, we have a new person. I see a new face. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you for my name. 
uh, we have a new candidate, Axel Isaac, is for MSC PhD. Please, so Saba, please, I'll reach you privately at the end of this class. There are something I discussed with Dr. Ife. Let me see if he has discussed with you. Axel Isaac, can you introduce yourself, please? So we'll meet you. <laughs> You need your mood. Isaac, you know. Mute, we're not hearing you. We're not hearing you. On mute, on mute, on mute. On mute. Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Please. Good afternoon, sir. Mm, Hello? Yes, go yes, we, on, we can, can hear you. Go ahead. We can, just, we can just, hear you now. Good. Okay, okay, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, also, I'm his video, so you can see his face. You can, yeah, see, you can face. see it. His, and his, his video is unmuted. You can see his face. I can't see the face. It's on your own, <laughs> your own phone. Or we are seeing him loud and clear. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's okay now. Yes, it's okay. Okay, Isaac, let's meet you. Your name and uh, other thing. Okay, good afternoon, sir. Hello? Yes, go on. Yeah, yeah hello. Okay, I am I am Familola Isaac. Familola. And Familola Isaac and MSC PhD students. Okay. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, you mind to tell us your location? Because um I know you're not uh, you're, you're speaking from a distance. Yes, sir. Thank you. What I'm speaking you do, from too? at present. What you do, too? I am speaking from Owo, you know, those states. Okay. Okay. What Which are you institution are you coming from yeah. here? You said... <laughs> Do you want to know where, where, where you work from us? Or, where you work, I, yeah. I work, I work, I work, I'm working at Rufus Giwa Polytechnic or work. Okay. You're welcome. All right. You're, work, you're welcome. Please. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll communicate with you. I don't know if there are other people in your class. So you create a WhatsApp group. So we we'll have to disseminate information. We know how we manage to get on today. So that okay, I, yes. I remember you. So at least once we pass information to the group, people will see. Other, okay, other members of your class, which I don't, I don't think they are around, right? so that you will be familiar with information. All right. Yes, so, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You are welcome. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. You uh, are welcome. So I don't know if there's any other thing. If not, I can call on someone to take closing thing. Yes, I. The major challenges I'm 